And as always, there is, um, we don't just sing songs because they're pretty. There's always a reason and a, and a point and a message to it. So the, the question would be, have you met the master? Do you know the master that they sing of? Have you met the master? And if you have, has he changed your life? That's what we're going to be talking about today. And as we go through this entire book of Acts, it is about the master and the fact that if you have met him, if you have had a, a confrontation, and it sometimes it comes across that way, when a sinner meets the creator of the world, then you will forever be changed. You cannot have a, 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 a conversation and a life-changing experience without having life change. And so have you met the master? I pray that you have. If you have not, then today we'll give you that chance. As a matter of fact, everything we're going to be talking about is the gospel, and it is that, that reason to have a relationship with Christ, that hope of a relationship with Christ. And so since you have your Bibles in your hand, since you brought the, the sword with you to church, open it up to the first book of Acts, to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to be there for a little while, but today we're just going to be in three verses of that. And I want to remind you that last week we had an introduction to Acts, kind of where it came from, the history, the writer, the time, the frame, the people, and all of that. And that's important to it. But now we're beginning the study in the book of Acts. And it will be a study, and I pray that you all are excited about this and that it won't just be a Sunday thing. If, if this is just a Sunday deal, you're not going to get much out of it. I promise you. As a matter of fact, you will forget pretty much everything. It will impact you. It might change you kind of like the meal you ate last week. You have no idea what it was. It gave you energy. You couldn't, you couldn't remember. You couldn't say thank you for it. But if you spend some time really eating this, really developing a hunger and a, and a flavor for this book, it will change your life. So I pray that you will do more than just come on Sunday mornings and hear it preached. I pray that throughout the week you will take time to study what is being preached and what is ahead and behind this book. You'll find this in or around the seat where you are. This is, uh, I'm, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. This is a piece of paper that, that you can take notes on. Not because anything this preacher is going to be saying is noteworthy, but because the book that I'm going to be reading from is 100% noteworthy. And so while we study this book of Acts, find these papers that are around you. If you need some more, there's some right next to Perry on the left and a pen. Jot down some notes because I believe the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you. And as he does, as he says something to you, uh, like, uh, courts, go check this out or follow this reference, do it throughout the week. Don't, don't neglect that, that prompting of the Holy Spirit. And so that's just a little, a little setup for you to please do be taking notes as we go through this. In your bulletin, on the back side of the order of service, there is also some notes, some questions, some application, some references that you can go further into study with. I encourage you to use those. So today we're going to be in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I want to, uh, want to remind you a few things. I'm going to do this each time at the beginning because we need repetition. And so as we repeat these things, I pray that they will take home in your brain and that it will, that it will create a memory that, uh, that you cannot forget. And so if we could sum up the books of that, book of Acts, the second book, remember Luke was basically the, the precursor to it. Acts comes in and follows it through. Remember, it's the, it's the spotlight that shows us from the, from the Gospels to the Epistles. It gets us across this bridge. If we could sum all this up into one sentence, it would say the Lord took a group of ordinary men and through the power of the Holy Spirit used them to turn the world upside down. We're going to get to that in Acts chapter 17. He, through the power of the Holy Spirit, took ordinary people and turned the world upside down. As a matter of fact, the world is still, should still be, and in some places and sometimes where revival takes place is still upside down in a good way, in a good way. He took ordinary men and did this. The main emphasis of this entire book is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We're going to talk about that today. The emphasis, the thesis of this would be the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Remember that all of this happens, this is, this is good to remember, all of this happens right after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts takes place and begins right after. We're not, we don't have much time between these events. This happens days, even hours, after the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Forty days plus ten is where we're going to be this morning. Forty days plus ten, Pentecost, fifty. That's what happens during this time of the ascension and then the Holy Spirit coming down to be among and on the church. The entire book of Acts, if you go from beginning to end, the entire book of Acts was written in about 30 years. You young people are thinking, wow, that's a long time. No, no, 30 years in antiquity is, is but, a, 
blink. It's a vapor. It, it, it doesn't even, doesn't hardly register as a blimp on history in the book of history. 30 years is a short time, which means this stuff is accurate. It was written right after it happened. Not long, and it wasn't like uh, folklore set in. This is accurate and, and good information. So we pick, or, and, and sorry, before we get to, to Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, uh, we're going we're gonna to keep hearing this one verse, Acts 1, 8. Acts 1, 8 is, is what we're going to meditate on and going to kind of let our, our minds continually wash over this verse. And the verse is this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is kind of the key pen verse to all of the, of the book of Acts. That verse right there. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what does it... Uh, what does it say that we are to be about doing? What is the commandment here? What is the goal? What is the purpose of this book of Acts for us to, to continue to, to study it? It's because we are to be his witnesses. His witnesses. You are to do what that, what that verse that we sang just a few moments ago says, that you are to be about the Father's work. You're to be doing his ministry. You're to be his witnesses in Jude, Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Like the disciples, we are, we are to faithfully proclaim a gospel. To faithfully proclaim a gospel, and God has the results. He's going to take care of everything. We, to, we devote ourselves to a few things that we're also going to pick up in the book of Acts. Chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the epistles. That's the gospel. That's the book of Acts. We're going to devote ourselves to this New Testament. You can't leave the Old Testament out. You can't even understand the New Testament without the, the road that it creates from the Old Testament. We're going to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. That's what we're doing this morning. In church, it's fellowship. We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Four main themes of the church and of every church service should be these things. We get one of them pretty well, don't we? Any clue what I'm talking about? That breaking of bread, right? We Baptists are pretty good at breaking bread. There's three other options that we have to hit. We have to remember we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to prayer. So with those thoughts in mind, let's read Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where we're going to spend the, the majority or the rest of our time this morning. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it begins as this. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking to the things pertaining the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Let's pray. Let's ask God to really reveal what these verses, these three beginning verses mean to us. Would you pray with me? Father, as we have opened your word and we wait uh, in expectation and in need, in great need of you to, to, to open this before us, to allow us to see and to know and to hear what this means, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would do just that. Father, we, we hold you to your word as you are perfect and immutable and unchanging. You promise. You promise to reveal this to us, Lord, if we ask for wisdom, you would provide. Father, I'm asking this morning that you would allow us to, to see this, this book and these verses specific in a way that would, would motivate us to be those witnesses, in a way that would create in us a passion and a desire, as even the Daniels have spoken of, to be about the mission of fulfilling the Great Commission. Father, we are your ready servants. Come and speak to us, move in us, create a revival within our spirit that would be unquenchable. Lord, that would point all people to you and to your glory and to your namesake. Father, we love you and we praise you for your perfect word. And in your son's name we pray, amen. Remember that this is in a continuation from that book of Acts that he was written to Theophilus. And he even starts it out in that very same way. He says, that former account that I made, O Theophilus, this is the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey? He used to say that now for the rest of the story. Well, this is the rest of that story. 
And in great detail, Luke goes in to do this. It would be good for you to go back and read, by the way, today, Luke chapter 24, 4, verses 44 through 53. It's the end of the book of Luke. Go back and read that today and this afternoon, and I think it's going to help you to put these into, into a good order. Uh, by the way, did you know, some of you are thinking, well, the book of Acts is pretty big. I mean, you, got, you told me yesterday or last Sunday that Luke wrote you know, more of the Old Test- New Testament than anybody. That's a pretty daunting task. If you sat down today, assuming that all of you read at least better than I do, and I imagine that you do, you could read it in two and a half hours. You could read through the entire book of Acts in two and a half hours. That's a pretty short time. That's not bad. 28 chapters. You know, you could read through the entire book in 70 hours, the entire Bible. If you didn't stop, you could read through the entire Bible in 70 hours. Anybody want to take that challenge? Come on, 70 hours of good spending time. No, you probably wouldn't be able to do that. But if you could, that's how long it would take. It's not impossible. The Bible is very possible. It's very perfect for us. It was written for us so that we would know God. So I pray that you are involved in digging deep into this book and this Bible that God asks us to know him through. So notice in this, in this verse, notice that Jesus has a pattern to what he does. You know, you know the word Christian comes from, it, it means little Christ, a Christian, a Christ follower, one who desires to be like the master. We sang, sang that song, to be like the master. A Christian should desire to be like his master. Jesus sets a pattern right here. Luke tells us of this pattern that Jesus has, and he says, follow after him. Be like he is. It says in verse 4, oh, the former account that I made to you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. When you study Scripture, don't just fly through it and fly over it. You miss so much of the English language that's, that's built into there to teach us something. If you just read that through, you would say, okay, do and teach. Big deal. No, there's a point to this. There's depth to how Jesus taught. He began to do and then he began to teach. Even Jesus did this. He, do, he does and he teaches. Jesus was a doer first and a teacher second. He didn't say, dads, do as I say and not as I do. You know that hypocritical statement that we hear a lot of times even joke about? Jesus didn't say that. He did and he taught, which means his lifestyle, his actions, his deeds went perfectly in unison with his teaching. It went perfect in step with that. He practiced what he preached. Are you following his example, Christian? Do you follow his example? And when you don't, does it break you? I believe there's nothing, nothing more destructive in our families than hypocrisy. Did you hear that? There's nothing more destructive in this church than hypocrisy. There's nothing more destructive in our convention than hypocrisy. When we say we believe that book, I believe in Jesus, I follow after him, and then we turn and leave, and six days out of the week we do the exact opposite, or nearly that. It's hypocrisy. Do you practice what you preach? Are you doing first, teaching second? Are you living and leading? Please don't play the part of the hypocrisy. Please don't be a hypocrite. Preach to yourself. Allow the accountability of Scripture and brothers and sisters in Christ to hold you to that standard. Because we destroy, we bring shame on the name of Christ. When we say we believe this and then we continually and continually fall and do the very same things. Quick yourself like men, it says in Scripture. Be a man of God. Live according to his Scripture. And the book of Acts plays it out for us perfectly. That's why it's so important. At this time, at this moment in history, this is why we need this book ever more present. Now, did you know that before you can do, remember Jesus, he did and he taught. But before you and I can do, we have to be something. Did you know that? You you can't just do if you haven't been. Let me explain this maybe in an illustration. Maybe it makes sense. I don't know. Uh, I heard of a story one time that a 10-year-old boy was at a field at an air show on, on, you know, like the jets and the Navy and the Air Force, all big air shows going on. And he's there watching it. He meets one of the pilots, you know, a young Navy boy or whatever, comes down, gives him those little plastic wings, you know, that we all used to love. They used to give those out. They don't anymore on planes. They give you stale peanuts. I don't know. They gave him this. He was so interested in how this, how this pilot worked and hearing about his plane and seeing it fly and do its, do its maneuvers. 
And at a moment when everybody's attention was on something else, that 10-year-old boy took off jogging across the run strip, across the, uh, the airstrip. Nobody saw him. Climbed up in that F-16, popped down in the, in the uh, captain's chair in the seat, starts pressing buttons trying to get this thing to come on. Finally, people realize there's, there's, there's somebody in that jet. This is not good. <laughs> they run out there. They pull him out and say, what are you doing? He's like, I, I wanna, I'm going to fly. No, you can't fly this. And he says, yeah, I think I can. I just spoke with the pilot. I've got my wings. I've seen, I've seen that movie with, uh, you know, Tom Cruise like nine times. And I'm one of the best paper airplane makers in all of my class. How would that work? It would end in destruction, right? And multi-million dollar plane probably in, bowling, in a ball of flame. He has to be before he can do. He can't just say, I, I am now. I decided to be a pilot. I'm 10 years old. I go, I'm qualified, right? No, he has to be first before he can do and before he can teach. This is what we must remember. Before you can honestly teach what Christ is and who he is, you must know Christ and be known by Christ. You must know this Jesus. You must submit your life to him as Lord and Savior. And that is a full submission. Not just for temporary service. Not just for a, a few years, you know, when it's, when it's struggle, when it's hard, when it's difficult, when I need him. This is a lifetime service that you give him as Savior and Lord. You belong to him. You are a new creation. That is that being and becoming. Sure, people tell me all the time, say, preacher, there's a lot of good things going on out there in the lost world. They're helping a lot of good people. They're giving. They're, they're, they're doing things. How does that work into your theology? I just said you have to be before you can. Well, I can do a lot of things. As a matter of fact, I've had a lot of mission people, both with Islam and Mormonism and all that other stuff, come to Russia and do a lot of good things. But what's the motive? What's the purpose? What's the reason behind it? Well, oftentimes, you know why we do things? Guilt. Men, the honeydew list is on the fridge. Do you do it because you love her? Or is there guilt? Well, the end result kind of plays into that. She knows, by the way, you're not fooling her. <laughs> if you do it because you, she, you love her, because it needs to be done, she doesn't have to put the list on the refrigerator. But if you do it out of guilt, then there's, then there's motive in there. There's personal motive. I think a lot of good things go on around the world, but much of it is done out of guilt and out of a need for self-affirmation. Pat me on the back. See, the Christian, though, does it so that no one receives the glory but Christ alone. You have to be before you can do, before you can teach. And this is what Jesus asks. See, see if you don't do that, then you get things out of place and, and you're teaching moralism. Moralism is one of the words on the little, little insert in your, in your uh, bulletin. What is moralism? Moralism is what oftentimes we, we, we find in our kids' lives. They're good, pretty good. They don't go to prison for very long. They don't steal very much. They don't lie very often. You know, they're moral. Basically good citizens. And so we, we're like, whew, we're going to make it till they're 18. <laughs> Honey, it's going to be okay. That's not good enough. That's moralism. That's just hoping that they're basically moral and good people. It's a weak attempt to cheat God for salvation. To try to, to, try to buy God's grace, to buy his goodness, to buy heaven. And God calls it sin. As a matter of fact, it may be the worst sin if you categorize sin. It's you saying, my goodness is equal to or greater than the blood of Christ. Think of that. My goodness, my morality, my ability to say no to these things I want to do is equal to or greater than the blood of Christ. That is a huge offense, ultimate sacrificial offense before God. Salvation is a supernatural, a supernatural act of God in which he takes your sin off of you and he places them on Jesus Christ. We're studying this in Sunday night. It's called penal substitution. It's where a substitute comes in and takes the, the penalty for something you should, you should have to give. It is the sacrifice that only God can do and no good deed would ever erase your bad. We point fingers at Islam because they believe that their good and their bad is going to be weighed by Allah at the end. We point fingers at him and say, that's ridiculous. But yet we live the same way oftentimes. 
We assume the same things. We do good in order to hopefully feel better about the bad that we did on Saturday night. It's moralism. It's rot. It's sin. We must know God. We must have accepted Christ as our Savior. We must have become a new creation. It is the gospel. The only part that we can bring to repentance, as I've often said from Jonathan Edwards, the only part that we can bring to the cross is the sin that makes it mandatory. We can bring no good works. If you expect that your good deeds are going to somehow win you favor with God, you are failing. The only thing we can do in biblical salvation, in biblical salvation, is to humbly submit and repent of our sin. And that's a word we do not like to hear very often because it points ten cannons straight at our heart. Guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Ten times guilty. You deserve hell, but for the love of God, you can have repentance. Have you done that? Have you seen your sins, which are many, which were piled up and laid on top of Christ himself on the cross? Have you seen that? Or do you pretty much consider yourself to be a a pretty good fellow? There's a whole lot worse than me. It's what I hear most often when I'm, when I'm talking to people and hearing their testimony or the lack of testimony. They say, I'm not that bad. I've messed up a little bit years ago. It was years ago. And I've been doing better. Clean myself up. Turned over a new leaf. Put on a new t-shirt. But they never had a life-changing experience with the God of creation. They never repented of that sin and said, I am guilty and I deserve hell. If you've never experienced that, if you've never done that, I submit that you're lost. I tell you that according to the book of Acts, according to the gospel, according to the epistles, if you have not been broken by your sin under the weight of eternal judgment and a perfect and holy God, if you've never seen your sin as sinful, how could you flee from it? What were you fleeing from? Who were you fleeing to? Do you know that Jesus has saved you? Have you found forgiveness through the precious blood of Jesus Christ and Him alone? I pray that you have, I pray that that's where you are. Here Luke is reminding Theophilus that Jesus has given the apostles, whom he had personally chosen, by the way, Jesus had chosen these men, he has given them a commandment. Jesus had given the apostles a commandment, a responsibility, something they must do. Let's pick it up in in verse 2. Jesus began both to do and to teach. We've covered that. Until the day in which he was taken up, After he, hear this part, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. It says commandments and it's plural, but really we can bring it down to one command. There are many commandments. There is the law. The law is there to prove to you that you are a a lawbreaker. You cannot possibly keep them. There is one commandment that he's pointing to right here. It is the gospel above all. It's saying that that you are to give the gospel, you're to share the gospel. This great commission is this commandment. It's not a it's not a request, it's not an idea, it's not a you know, the church would do better if you if you did this. It's a commandment that God gives us specifically to us. It's not like some of the other things we often put uh, into our lives and think that we must do them. Have you ever heard this this statement? Godliness is next to cleanliness. You will not find that in scripture. It's not there. Oftentimes we we add these rules to our lives like, well, I can't eat this. Old Testament definitely did it. The Hebrews still today do it. I can't wear this. I have to cut my hair this way. We add all these rules. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm boiling everything down to one commandment for the Christian. Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the commandment that he's speaking of right there. That's the great overarching command that he's given. He gave it in Matthew, he gave it in Mark, he gave it in Luke. All of them end with this great commission. All of this has one command that he says, and the the command goes just like this. Go and preach. Now you ladies are thinking, I'm off the hook. (laughs) Because the preacher said before, we don't preach. We're not preachers. No, no, this is a different form. This isn't, this isn't leading the church, preaching on Sunday morning. This is going out and sharing your testimony, sharing the good news with your neighbor, and you are 100% on the chart for that, as much so as I am. We are all preachers in that sense, as we are to be missionaries and to be about this. 
We are to be sharing our witness with a lost and dying world. It says, go and preach. What do we preach? You should know what to preach. Sometimes we preach moralism. It's easy to get into that, by the way. It's so easy to fall into moralism. Just, just young person, do this. Don't do this. It's so easy to teach that and to preach that. That's not the end goal. We teach moralism. We teach prosperity gospel. We sang about it just a moment ago. Lord, I'm not asking for anything. I just want to know you. So often we preach prosperity gospel. Come to Jesus and he will take you to heaven, take away your cancer, give you a million dollars, you'll win the lottery. Put your hand on the TV screen. I mean, I'm, I'm, these things are real. These are actually being taught and preached. Sometimes we teach secular humanism. Again, tonight's study of the Sunday night service is talking all about these things. Secular humanism, it is be good for goodness sake. Come and be good to your neighbor. This God thing, we don't really believe in him. I mean, if he, if he suits your purpose, if the end justifies the means, then use him to get there. But we don't really have to have him. Are we teaching these things or are we teaching the pure gospel? The gospel that says in Matthew 28, verse 19, it says this, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Verse 20, key verse. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Teaching them is what we do. Teach them the gospel. Teach them the Bible. We don't rewrite it. We don't make it up. We don't, we don't add to it. We teach them the Bible. Remember, this is what we must do, but we must be before we can do it. We must be, we must do, we must teach. The truth that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's what we teach. If you teach anything besides that, if that's not your main point in the gospel presentation, you're probably going to fall off into moralism. He, through the Holy Spirit, gives us that commandment. He says, be and do, go and preach. Practice what you preach. Paul says, I not only preached Christ crucified, Paul said that that's all I preach, is Christ crucified. It's in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. He said, I did not come to you with eloquent speech or with wisdom of men. I came and preached Christ and Christ crucified. Not with human wisdom, but with a demonstration of the power. A demonstration of the power. Have we seen many demonstrations, by the way, of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? When was the last time you felt a demonstration? I don't don't mean you laid hands on somebody and they grew an arm that was missing. I mean, when was the last time you were sharing your testimony or the gospel with somebody and you felt the Holy Spirit move through you? I didn't even know that verse, <laughs> and it came out perfect. I didn't know that that's where I needed to, to reason and to speak and to encourage this person, but it did, and it was exactly what they needed to hear. When was the last time you had a supernatural demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power through you? Well, you have to be, and you have to do, and then you teach, and these things will happen. Verse 5, verse 5 of that 1 Corinthians passage 2 that I was speaking of where Paul says, I preach Christ and Christ crucified him alone. Verse 5 says this, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If when we preach, they look at you and say, oh man, she's awesome. She's wonderful. You should write a book. You should start a church, maybe a cult then we're doing something wrong. All of the good, all of the, all of the faith that we place should always go back towards Christ, always back on Him. Jesus commands them to do this. He tells us that as we are going, we are to be preaching this good news. Now, for the remainder of the time, we're going to spend it on just that third verse. We're going to go through this pretty rapidly, so please stick with me. But this third verse is, is pivotal for what you need to understand out of these. Verse 3 says this, To whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking to them the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. These infallible proofs he presented. Infallible, meaning they cannot be changed, they cannot be manipulated, they're facts, they're proofs. What are some of those infallible proofs? Have you ever studied the the Gospels and read through them and and tried to see what is it speaking of? Maybe sometimes we read through it so quickly we miss this. 
I'm going to give you some of them. Eyewitness testimony to this historic event that took place. Eyewitness testimony throughout all of history has been the most uh, concrete evidence we could find. I mean, now we have DNA, and that pretty much answers a lot of questions. But back in the day, and even today, when you say, I was there and I saw it in a court of law or in civil court or whatever it is, it, it holds some validity. Eyewitness testimony is what we have back then. A person testifying, I was there, I saw it. We have over 500 people saying, I saw Jesus. I saw him with my own eyes. I was there. 500 eyewitnesses that we know of in Scripture. Perhaps many more. And you say, to what? What did they what? What did they witness? The resurrection. Do you know, just, just as a point of interest, do you know that if, if we take away the resurrection of Christ, we have no Christianity? It's that important. And if it's that important, I want to tell you that all throughout time for the last 2,000 plus years, all, of the, all that the devil's tried to do is destroy that one point. It's a, it's, a, it's a castle of cards. The resurrection of Christ is the key card. If they pull that out and the castle falls, they win, we lose. But you know what? It's an infallible proof that he rose again. And that's what we base everything on. If Christ died, let me just back up a little bit. If Christ died on, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, Stay dead, we have nothing. He could be God's son. He could have lived a perfect life. He could have died, blood shed for you. But if he did not raise from the dead, you have nothing. You're still dead in your sins. He had to defeat death. He had to, to defeat sin. He had to come back to life. This is what we're talking about. This is the infallible proofs. What are they? Eyewitnesses accounts right here. Firstly, let me give you another one. The, the, the chief priests, this is one that I always found to be very uh, convicting to the fact that this happened. The chief priests, whenever the body's missing on, on resurrection Sunday morning, what did the chief priests do? They didn't say, they didn't say, well, you know, obviously Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> they weren't going to admit that. They came up with a plot, a scheme. They bought off the guards that had been there and told them, we're going to give you a large sum of money. Tell them that, that you were sleeping and the disciples came and they stole the body. Tell them that they overpowered you. Tell them that they, they just took off with the body. Because, you know, if they could come up with a body, everything we believe about Christ would have been a lie. They could not come up with a body. They did not have a body, so they had to come up with a scheme, and that's what they did. Believe me, all of Jerusalem, those Pharisees, those scribes, they knew what the prophecy was. They knew what had been the rumblings, that Jesus was going to come back to life. Do you think they would have just let this happen? Do you think this happened just in the corner of a, of a cemetery somewhere that no one was looking no, this happened by God's ordained plan since before the foundations of the earth. And it did happen. So they had to plot a scheme. So they said, we're going to pay you this large sum of money. If the Roman, by the way, if a, in a Roman legionnaire or anybody in the Roman army, if, if a person escaped from their care or if a person didn't die on the cross or if a person left the prison and they weren't supposed to, that Roman soldier would have to pay the penalty, whatever it was, their life in place of the other. So know that this would have been a pretty serious thing. The, the greatest man in all of history had just been put to death. And he claims to come back to life. And so there are moving political things going on underneath the, the seam. So that's why this is such a big deal. The Pharisees and scribes buy them off. They say, we will talk and pay off the Roman soldiers and those above them if we need to. Just say that there's nobody and that the disciples took them. Nextly, we see that Jesus shows himself to a woman. To a woman. I could go into great detail as to why that's important, but women couldn't even stand in court in this day. They were represented by their husband. It's not a bad, I'm not saying that it was some uh, egalitarian, I mean some uh, patriarchal thing where the man had his foot on the woman and you just stay at home. That's not it. They were represented by their husbands, but their voice did not count as an eyewitness. And yet, who's the first one? To see Jesus, Mary Magdalene. Who is Mary Magdalene? Not just Mary the mother, not just some other Mary. She was possessed by seven demons at one time. We're talking a bad girl until Christ came into her life. And then everything changed. She's the first one. Who next? John and Peter run to the tomb. They get there. They look in. Do they find a body? Nothing. Infallible eyewitness testimony right there. Two more. Do not see the body. Uh, Cleophas and his companion on the road to Emmaus. Do you remember this part? A man comes up to them. They don't know who he is, starts asking the questions. What's going on? You haven't heard? 
they tell Jesus. They don't know that it's Jesus yet. You don't know what's been going on in Jerusalem. They eat with him. And then their understanding's made made known. They know now this is Jesus. Eyewitnesses. Jesus appears in the upper room the first time, minus Thomas. Do you remember? Doors are locked. Why were the doors locked? Because they're scared to death, literally, for their life. The apostles, the disciples, and the women there in the upper room. Doors locked. Jesus comes in, minus Timothy. They all see him. They know exactly who he is. He says, peace. You would have to say peace. <laughs> peace be with you. The doors were locked. How did he get here? Secondly, he comes, appears eight days later in the same room, upper room with Timothy. Do you remember this story? This is very important. He comes to Timothy, and, and Timothy says, you know, he had said, I won't believe this unless I see him. After the, the apostles all said they saw him the first time in the room. Jesus comes to him. We pick it up in John chapter 20, verse 26 through 29. He says this. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came and the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them, meaning he came in through shut doors. And he said, peace to you. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, he just went straight to Thomas, who had just eight days before said, I will not believe this unless I see it. He went straight to Thomas, eye to eye, I can imagine, fixed eyes with him. He said, Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand and put it here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answers this way. And Thomas replied and said to him, my Lord and my God. There's irrefutable, irrefutable evidence right there. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe irrefutable evidence Thomas saw him and believed him. A lot of times we call him Doubting Thomas, and uh, I promise you, Thomas doubted no more. Matter of fact, historically, he also went on to be martyred, killed, as many of them did. Another strong proof of the resurrection of Christ is that, uh, that many of them died this martyr's death through unthinkable pain. I was talking this morning with Derek out here about some of the ways they killed the apostles. We don't have it in Scripture, but we have it historically accurate through other uh, non-biblical historical writers of the time. Pliny the Younger, Josephus, other men that wrote, not Christians, not Jews, wrote about what was going on. They talk about the death of these men and these women. They died, and why did they die? Irrefutable evidence. Irrefutable evidence. They would not deny the fact that they had seen Christ if they would just say, I take it back, it was a mirage, uh, some kind of psychic." Trophics, I don't know, something we were all breathing, that we might have seen this Jesus. No, they died, willingly went to a painful and torturous death because of what they knew they had seen. If you remember, just after the crucifixion, what was going on with the disciples? Just after the crucifixion, just after the Garden of Gethsemane, when they went and took him, they all fled, disbanded, ran crazy for fear of their life, rightfully so. If they're going to kill the, the captain of their faith, what are they going to do with all the others? They fled, and so think about this. These, these men who, and women who had fled right after the resur resurrection, right after the crucifixion, now are standing in the street. They're boldly preaching the gospel. Irrefutable evidence. I don't care what happens to this body. I must tell what I've seen and heard. Irrefutable evidence. They would stand in the very streets days after the crucifixion of their Lord and Savior and say, He is alive. Here's the gospel. He's alive. This is irrefutable evidence. What accounts for this sudden and dramatic change in them? The risen Savior. They met the risen Savior. That's how they could stand there, knowing that they possibly and will in the future tense die. Irrefutable evidence they had seen Christ, so they must say it. If you've had an experience with Christ, you must say this. You must know it to be true. Skeptics often say this, you know, when you, when you come to that point when you're talking to them. It's a big deal. People die for lies all the time, right? Suicide bombers dying so they could have 40 virgins in, virgins in, in heaven. People die for uh, the Hellbop Comet dude, whatever that was back in the 90s. Jim Jones. They often use this, skeptics. They say, see, people are deceived all the time and this happens. People die for all sorts of other things, environmentalism. I've heard of people 
catching, lighting themselves on fire to save a forest or some animals. I mean, people will die for all sorts of crazy things. So they say, see, there's no difference. However, you got to remember these people willingly died for the truth. But let's flip that around just a little bit. The Bible says, actually, in, uh, it's a, you know, I can't find it now, that, that a good man might, might possibly die for somebody. But no one would die for a lie. Think of this fact. These people willingly go to the torture rack, willingly go to be sawed in half, willingly go to be boiled, to be flayed, to be crucified upside down, to be beheaded, to be beaten with clubs, to be, to be stoned. They willingly do that for a lie? No, they might do it if they're deceived, but these people saw Christ, or so they said. And so would they willingly go to their death for the lie? No. No one would do that. None of you in here would do that. Now, people die for things. They die for their country. They die for, they die for what they believe in. But no one would die for a lie. None of you would. It's ludicrous. But yet, over and over and over, it happened during this, during this reign of Nero. To the tune of, he even stuck them on, on, on spikes down the path and lit them on fire. These were Christians that were dying for their faith and what they had seen and heard. 500 started out with 11 Started out with three, really, people seeing Christ. And then it went to the 11, and then it, plus the women. And then it went to the 150, and then it went to the 500. And now 3,000 people after the day of Pentecost, willing to die for irrefutable evidence. This is what Christ does in us when he changes us. Faith was made sight. There was no more questioning. There was no more, I'm not sure that actually happened. Faith was made sight, and everything changed. And then the last evidence that I want to give you is Paul himself. Paul was brought to Christ as one, he says, born out of, out of due time, born in a, in a strange time. He did not see uh, the ascension of Christ. He did not see, he probably did see the crucifixion of Christ, but he saw him on the road to Damascus. Do you remember? Let's read the, let's read the account. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, it says this. Paul says, For I delivered to you first of all that which was also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Again, he's pointing back to the Scriptures. And that he, wa that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at one time, of whom the greater part remain in present. They have not been killed yet, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, and then by the apostles, and lastly, this is lastly, he was seen by me, also as one being born out of time. This is Paul um, coming to Christ by a vision that he saw on the road to Damascus. He saw Christ, and Christ said, Paul, oh, why are you persecuting me? And he was forever changed. Irrefutable evidence, many proofs seen over and over again. But do you remember that John chapter 20, verse 29 verse? I ask you this morning, have you, have you seen enough proof? Have you been proven? Are the facts good enough for you? Are they sufficient? Would you, would you vote up or down? Christ was risen from the dead or he still is dead? Do you have enough proof to make your decision? John 20 verse 29 says this, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are those that have not seen and needed all of that proof and yet still believe. You know, the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. You must have faith in this. So I ask you, do you believe? Do you have faith on Christ? Or are you waiting? Are you needing more proof? Say, preacher, you almost got me, but I just need one more piece of the puzzle. If you need more proof, you'll have none. Very likely, I would give you that. Someone would give you that. The scripture would prove that. And you'd say, I just need one more piece. And Jesus, Jesus said that there will be no other proof given except for the, the, the truth of Jonah. And that was Jonah spent three days in the well and then came out. That's, a, that's a, a preview of Christ's death on the cross and the resurrection. It says, that's the only proof you need. Do you accept it? I ask you this morning as we close, do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you come to the place where you lay all your works aside? Say, it's, it's not by me. 
I know my bad deeds, and my good deeds could never outweigh that. Lord, I need you. I submit to you. You are my Lord and my Savior. Have you said that? I pray that you have. If you haven't this morning, is the time to do it. See your sin. Repent of your sin. Cling to the cross. He is the only one. He is the only one that can save to the uttermost. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to this moment in your service, on your day with your people, Lord, I pray that we have been convicted by you. Father, that your Holy Spirit has has hit us all exactly where you know we must be struck. Father, I pray that we would, we would not hold anything back from you, that we would not uh, let our pride or our arrogance or our uh, self-determination of fixing our own problems get in the way of submitting to you. Lord, whatever the need might be this morning, I pray that it's given over. Lord, as we, uh, as we sing these verses, speak to us. Lord, as you speak to us, compel us to, to respond. Father, if there is, a, if there is a, a need that we have, a brother that we have offended, I pray that we would go and repent. Father, if we have offended you, I pray that we would go and repent. Lord, we ask all these things for your glory and for your fame in our own lives and among these people. We have the privilege of living. Lord, help us to fulfill this great commission. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?